Thomas Friedman. But first, a special thanks to our partners who have made this event celebrating our 20th anniversary possible. For the Hourglass has, in the past 20 years, brought talented thinkers to speak to the Lancaster community about important issues affecting our future and quality of life. And tonight's speaker, Thomas Friedman, is in that tradition. Uh, he has been awarded the three Pulitzer Prizes for his correspondence with the New York Times. He's the author of seven best-selling books, the last titled, Thank You for Being Late. He is recipient of many awards, most recently the National Press Club's Lifetime Achievement Award. Tom Friedman was born in 1958 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He attended the St. Louis Park High School, where he, which he credits with having a major impact on his life. For it was there that he studied journalism under Hattie Sternberg, described by Friedman as the toughest teacher I ever had and a woman of clarity in an age of uncertainty. And because of her influence, he gave up his ambition to become a professional golfer. <laughs> so he would become a journalist. But still in high school, a trip to Israel created in him a lifelong fascination with the Middle East. Friedman graduated summa cum laude from Brandeis University and took a master's degree from St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And while in England, he met and married Anne Buxbaum of Des Moines, Iowa. They now reside in Bethesda, Maryland. They have two daughters, Orly and Natalie. And after a brief stint with the United Press International, Friedman began in 1981 his long career with the New York Times. His first two assignments as Beirut bureau chief and then as Jerusalem bureau chief led to two Pulitzer Prizes for international journalism and the publication of his prize-winning and best-selling book, From Beirut to Jerusalem. This book remains the classic test for those studying the Middle East. And in 1995, the New York Times reinstated its foreign affairs column, and Friedman took it over as its columnist, a job he had coveted since high school. As the Times foreign affair columnist, Friedman crisscrosses the globe, writing one column a week on topics that he deems important. In this capacity, he has for 23 years identified and articulated those trends that shape our world today and will determine our world tomorrow. And in a tumultuous world, Friedman remains an optimist. In his own words, he says, I'm a socially liberal, deeply patriotic, pluralism loving, community oriented, fiscally moderate, free trade inclined, innovation obsessed, environmental capitalist. <laughs> I believe that America at its best can deliver a life of decency, security, opportunity, and freedom for its own people, and can also be a bulwark of stability and a beacon of liberty and justice for the people the world over. So it is now my pleasure to present to you Mr. Thomas L. Friedman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Lancaster. Thank you, Hourglass. It's great to be here. I've had a fascinating time meeting with the community leaders this afternoon. Um, you are my people. You are the people I really wrote about and wrote this book for. So I'm eager uh, to have this conversation. So I'm going to talk about my new book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration. First question I always get from people is, where from comes the title? Thank you for being late. And it actually comes from meeting people in Washington, D.C., where I live, for breakfast. And uh, I don't like to waste breakfast eating alone, if I can use that time to have an uh, interview with someone. So I often schedule business breakfast. And every once in a while, someone comes 10, 15 minutes late. And they say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. <laughs> one day, three and a half years ago, Peter Corsell, an energy entrepreneur, came 15 minutes late, did the usual Tom, I'm really sorry, it's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And I just spontaneously said to him, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. 
because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And best of all, best of all, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. Well, people started to get into it. They'd say, well, well you're welcome. Because they understood I was actually giving them permission to pause, to slow down, to reflect. In fact, my favorite quote from the front of the book is from my teacher and friend, Dove Seidman, who says, you know, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. That's when it starts to reflect rethink and reimagine. And boy, don't we need to be doing a lot of that today. Now this book was actually triggered when I paused and engaged with someone I, I wouldn't normally engage with. Um, I actually live in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of DC. And um, about once a week I take the subway to work to the New York Times Bureau in Washington, which is down near the White House. And for me that means uh, driving my car to the Bethesda Hyatt, I park in the public parking garage there. I then take the red line into DC, to the New York Times Bureau. Anyways, about three and a half years ago I did that, parked in the parking lot, got my timestamp ticket, uh, grabbed the red line into DC, spent the day at the Times office. I uh, took the red line back, uh, got my car, time stamp ticket, drove to the cashier's booth, handed him my ticket. He looked at it, looked at me and said, I know who you are. I said, great. He said, I read your column. I thought, great, the parking guy reads my column. He said, I don't always agree. I thought, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but I said, no, actually, that's good. It means you have to check every time. And... Um, and I drove off thinking, that's great, the car guy, parking guy, reached my column. Anyways, a week later, I took my weekly trip into D.C., parking garage, timestamp ticket, red line, office, New York Times, day, red line, back car, timestamp ticket, cashier's booth, same guys there. This time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog, would you read my blog? <laughs> I thought, oh my God. The parking guy is now my competitor. <laughs> what just happened? So I said, well, write it down for me and I'll look it up. So he tore off a piece of receipt paper and he wrote on it, odanambi.com. I got home, I fired up my computer, called it up right away. Turns out he's Ethiopian, writes about Ethiopian politics from the perspective of the Oromo people, a real democracy advocate. It was a little rough, but it, it, it wasn't bad. Anyways, I thought about him for a couple of days. I shared it with my wife, and I, I eventually concluded this was a sign from God that I should pause and engage this guy. But I didn't have his email, so the only way I could do that was park in the parking garage every day, which I did for four or five days. I can't remember how long it took now. Um, I parked under the, I got there in the morning, I parked under the gate so it couldn't come down. The morning he was in the booth, I got out. And I said, uh, Ayile, now I know his name, Ayile Bogia. I said, Ayile, um, I want your uh, email. I want to send you an email. And he uh, tore off another piece of receipt paper and wrote his email on. And that evening, we began an email exchange. And it's kind of funny. I've saved them all there in the front of the book. But I basically said to him, I have a proposition for you. I will teach you how to write a column in the New York Times if you will tell me your life story. And he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. Um, so uh, we agreed to meet a couple weeks later at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda. Um, I came with a six-page memo on how to write a column in the New York Times. I never really put it together this way until I had for him. And he came with his life story. Uh, Ethiopian grad of Haile Selassie University in Economics from Addis Ababa was a uh, political uh, activist, a, a Romo activist, and democracy advocate, uh, advocate in, in Ethiopia. He eventually got kicked out of the country for his democracy activism. We welcomed him here as a political exile. Um, and uh, he started blogging on Ethiopian websites uh, based in the West, but he, 
He found they were too slow. So he decided to start his own blog, and now, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered, he told me. His Google metrics say he's read in 30 different countries. This is my parking guy. And it's a wonderful story about how anyone today can participate in the global conversation. Well, I then explained to him how to write a column in the New York Times. I explained to him that a news story was meant to inform. I could do a, um, a news story about your community, and Art would tell me whether I inform better or worse. But a column, what I do, an opinion piece, is actually meant to provoke. So I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's basically what I do. I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or I'm illuminating something for you. And if I really do it well, I do both. And I produce either heat or light. Or heat and light. But I explained to Ayile that to do that actually required combining three chemicals. The first is what is your value set? What's the set of values that inform your opinion? Are you a Democrat, a Republican, a liberal, a conservative, a neocon, a libertarian, a Marxist, a Keynesian. What, what's the set of values that you're trying to push out into the world? Secondly, how do you think the machine works? And that's going to be the thrust of my talk here tonight. The machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places, in more ways, on more days. Because as a columnist, you see, I'm always carrying around in my head a working theory about how the biggest gears and pulleys of the world work. Why? Because I'm trying to take my values and push this machine in their direction. And if I don't know how the machine works, I either won't push it or I'll push it in the wrong direction. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? Because there's no column without people and there's no people without culture. Stir those three together, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes. And if you do it right, you too can write a column in the New York Times. Well, the more I explain this to Ayile, excuse me, um, allergies, um, the more I explain this to Ayile, the more I started to sit back and say, well, that's what a column is about. What's my value set? Those of you who read me know I have a rather quirky set of values. I'm not exactly a liberal. I'm certainly, I'm not a conservative. It's because my core values actually come from the small town in Minnesota, where I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s at a time and place when politics worked. And that grounding in that community, to this day, still informs my values more than anything else. How do I think the machine works today? And what have I learned about people and culture? And that was the book I decided to write. So the first half of Thank You for Being Late is, is about how the machine works today. And we're going to talk about that in detail next. And the second half is about how this machine is not just changing your world. It's reshaping your world. And it's reshaping five realms. Politics, geopolitics, the community, Ethics. Ethics and the workplace. So let's first talk about how the machine works. I'm going to grab my little handy clicker over here. Yikes. Um, yeah, I got it. <clears throat> so I think what is shaping more things in more places, in more ways on more days, is that we are currently in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So the uh, mo Mother Nature for me is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth in the developing world. If you were to put these on a graph, they would look like Glacier National Park 1913, Glacier National Park 2012. By the way, that glacier had been there for 7,000 years. This will be gone uh, in a few decades. You put that on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. Mother Nature looks like Lake Chad 1963 in Central Africa, and Lake Chad 2001, I gotta get it updated because it's just a fraction of that right now. Mother Nature looks like a hockey stick. This is a graph of global average temperature. Or she looks like 
a hockey stick, this is reported instances of extreme weather. Or she looks like the mother of all hockey sticks, global population growth through history. Put Mother Nature on a graph and she looks like an accelerating hockey stick. The second acceleration is in the market. Now the market for me is globalization, but not your grandfather's globalization. That was containers on ships and planes. That tends to be flat today. What is accelerating like a hockey stick is digital globalization. The way everything today is being digitized and globalized, through MOOCs and Facebook and PayPal and Amazon, you put that on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. It looks like total data consumed per month. Or it looks like another hockey stick, total mobile cellular subscriptions in the US and of course every country looks just the same. The third acceleration is in Moore's Law. So Moore's Law was coined in 1965 by Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, in a famous article in Electronics Magazine. And in that article, Gordon Moore posited that the speed and power of microchips would double roughly every 24 months. It's now closer to 30, and the price would stay roughly the same. Moore's Law has held up for 53 years. Now, every year since 1965, someone's written an article saying, Moore's Law's over, Moore's Law's over, Moore's Law's over. And what all those authors have in common is they were all wrong. This uh, PowerPoint is actually running, I'm pretty sure, on an Intel 14 nanometer chip. It has 37.5 million transistors per square millimeter. Um, Intel, under Moore's Law, uh, three years later, just began shipping its 10 nanometer chip. It has 100 million transistors per square millimeter. Your eye can't see it. Now that's very abstract. So what's the difference between a 14 nanometer chip and a 10 nanometer chip? It's the difference between a self-driving car that needs the whole trunk of the car to contain the brains of the car and a self-driving car that will need just a little box under the front seat. A few years ago, Intel's engineers, trying to explain the power of Moore's Law, took a 1971 Volkswagen Beetle. And they said, what if this Volkswagen Beetle had improved at the same rate microchips had since 1971, according to Moore's Law? And they calculated if it had, that Beetle today would go 300,000 miles an hour, it would get 2 million miles per gallon, and it would cost four cents. <laughs> You'd be able to drive it your entire life on a single tank of gas. That's the power of the technological exponential driving our lives. Now my friends Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson in their book The Second Machine Age, to drive this point home, tell the story of, um, famous story, uh, the man who invented the game of chess. And he gave the game to the king, and um, uh, King loved it. And he said, how can I reward you, good sir? And uh, the man said, you know, your highness, I just wanted to feed my family. And the king said, what would you like? He said, your highness, I'd actually just like you to take one kernel of rice, put it on the first square of this chessboard, two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, 16 on the next, 32 on the next, just keep doubling it, my family will be fine. The king, not realizing that if you just double something 63 times, the number you get is roughly 18 quintillion, said it shall be done. Not realizing he had promised the man more rice than existed on earth. Well, we just entered the second half of the chessboard when the doubling of Moore's Law starts to get really big numbers and we start to see really funky stuff, like cars that can drive themselves and machines that can beat humans in any game of chess, Jeopardy, or Go. So um, I'm not gonna go into detail about Mother Nature, I'm not gonna go into detail about the market, uh, globalization, acceleration, we can talk about those at question time. I wanna do a deeper dive on Moore's Law because it's really the driver of all of these things because my argument is basically more Moore's Law drives more globalization, more globalization drives more climate issues, and more solutions to all of these problems. So let's do a little deeper dive on Moore's Law. My chapter on that subject is called, What the Hell Happened in 2007? What the hell happened 
in 2007. I know what you're thinking. What's this guy talking about, honey? 2007. Such an innocuous year. Well, here's what happened in 2007. Let's see if I got all my props here. Mike gave me, yeah. The year was kicked off of 2007 in January of that year when a guy named Steve Jobs unveiled the first one of these babies. January 9th, 2007 at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is an iPhone. It's actually a handheld computer with more compute power in it than the Apollo space mission. And they tell me it doubles as a phone and a camera. That's, that's how the year was kicked off. And we're now about halfway through putting one of those babies into the hands of every person on the planet. January 9th, 2007. In 2007, a company called, actually late 2006, uh, called Facebook opened its platform to anyone with a registered email address and broke out of high schools and universities and was made available to anyone with a registered email address. And in 2007, Facebook went global. In 2007, a company called uh, Twitter uh, split off on its own independent platform and went global. In 2007, the most important software you probably have never heard of called VMware. VMware is what enables any operating system to work on any computer. VMware went public in 2007. In 2007, the second most important software you may have never heard of called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, was launched into the wild. Hadoop's what enables a million computers to work together as if they're one. I think that's called big data. Uh, Hadoop actually didn't invent those algorithms. They were invented by Google, GFS, and MapReduce. But as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, explains in the book, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back home. And what Google did was leave a trail of breadcrumbs for its big data algorithms that the open source community could then reverse engineer, and Hadoop was the free public version of it. Every one of your companies somewhere in the background is probably running Hadoop today. In 2007, the third most important software you've never heard of called GitHub opened its doors. GitHub today is the largest repository of open source software with over 15 million users. Every one of your technology officers is a regular visitor to GitHub, but I can assure you. In 2007, this company called Google bought a little known TV company called YouTube. And in 2007, this company called Google also launched into the wild its own operating system. I think they called it Android. In 2007, a guy up in Seattle named Jeff Bezos launched the world's first ebook reader. He called it the Kindle. And in 2007, IBM launched the world's first cognitive computer. They called it Watson. In 2007, three design students in San Francisco were attending the design conference that year. And um, they noticed all the hotel rooms were sold out. But one of them had three spare air mattresses. And they thought it might be cool if they tried to rent out their air mattresses to people who couldn't get hotel rooms. And it worked out so well for them. In 2007, they started a company called Airbnb. It's called Airbnb because of the founding three air mattresses. Here's what else happened in 2007. Uh, this is a graph, the blue uh, line there, is a graph of the cost of sequencing a human genome. You'll notice it's $100 million in 2001. It falls to $10 million in 2006. And then it goes over a cliff, like an EKG heading for a heart attack in uh, 2007, collapsing to $10,000. This is a graph of solar energy. Solar energy took off in 2007. As the people, as did the people of Pennsylvania can tell you, a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking. Between 2006 and 2008, America's total natural gas reserves increased by 35%. That is a staggering number in just 18 months, basically. In, this is a graph of what social networks look like. So that white line going down, that's actually the cost of generating a megabit of data. And you'll notice the line goes straight down like another EKG heading for a heart attack in uh, 2007. 
The blue line is the uh, speed of generating, of transmitting that data, and the two lines cross in 2008. That's close enough for me. In 2007, a uh, obscure, anonymous Japanese cryptocurrency expert wrote a paper launching a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. In 2007, Netflix streamed its first video. In 2007, the internet crossed a billion users. Actually, late 2006, scaled out in 2007. In 2007, this is a graph of cloud computing. You'll notice the first year we get statistics is actually 2008, which means the cloud was born in 2007. In 2007, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon to extend Moore's law and introduced non-silicon materials into its transistors. In 2005, Michael Dell, the founder of Dell Computers, retired. And in 2007, he decided he'd better come back to work. <laughs> Turns out, friends, 2007 may be understood in time as one of the greatest technological inflection points since Gutenberg. And we completely missed it. We completely missed it. Why? Because of 2008. <clears throat> you see, right when our physical technologies took off, like we were on a moving sidewalk in an airport that suddenly went from 5 to 50 miles an hour, right when that happened, our social technologies, all the managing reform, learning reform, regulatory reform, political reform, you'd want to go with such an acceleration in technology, they all froze because we entered the deepest recession since 1929. And in that gap between what happened to our physical technologies and what happened to our social technologies, a lot of people got completely unmoored. And we saw that in our last election, you saw that in Brexit, a lot of people began looking for radically different solutions. They became completely unmoored in that gap between what happened with our physical technologies and our social technologies. So what actually happened in 2007? Well, this computer running this PowerPoint, it actually has five key components, as all computers do. It's got the Moore's Law processor, it's got a storage chip, it's got networking, it's got software, and it's got a sensor, it's got a little camera. And what I do in the book is trace how all five were in Moore's Law. And I believe what happened in 2007, 2008, that period, is they all melded together into this thing we call the cloud. The cloud. But I never use the term the cloud in my book because it sounds so fluffy, so soft, so cuddly, so benign. Sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from both sides. This ain't no cloud, folks. This is what I call, uh, this is what I call in, in my book, uh, the supernova. A supernova, for the science students among you will know, is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. And I think what happened in 2007 was an explosion of energy, a release of energy by the convergence of all these technologies, a release of energy into the hands of men, women, and machines that changed four kinds of power overnight. First, it changed the power of one. What one person can do today as a maker or a breaker is like anything we've ever seen before. President Trump today can sit in the family quarters of the White House and tweet directly to a billion people around the planet without any editor, any filter, any libel lawyer, straight to a billion people. But here's what's really scary is the head of ISIS can do the exact same thing from his bunker in Raqqa province in Syria. Oh man, the power of one has really changed. Power machines have changed. 
Machines are acquiring all five senses. We've never lived in a world where machines had all five senses. We crossed that line, I believe, on February 14, 2011, on, of all places, a game show. There were three contestants. Two were the all-time Jeopardy champions, and the third contestant simply went by his last name, Mr. Watson which, of course, was an IBM cognitive computer. Mr. Watson passed on the first question, but he jumped in before the two humans. He buzzed in before them on the second question. See if you can get it. The question was, it's worn on the foot of a horse and used by a dealer in a casino. And in under 2.5 seconds, Mr. Watson said, in perfect Jeopardy style, what is a shoe? What is a shoe? And for the first time, we all got to watch live on television a cognitive computer solve a pun riddle faster than two human beings. And the world kind of hasn't been the same since. It's changed the power of many. Okay? It's changed the power of many. We now, we humans, men, women, machines have so much power we have become the largest forcing function on and in nature, which is why the new climate era has been named for us, the Anthropocene. And lastly, it changed the power of flows. See, for centuries, the people of Lancaster, they wanted to build up a lot of stocks. Stocks of this, agricultural stocks, the inventory stocks. You were measured by how much stocks you had, how many stocks you had. Today, you're measured by how much you're in touch with the digital flow. Where did you want to build your town in the Middle Ages? You wanted to build it on the river, because that river brought you, the flow of that river brought you ideas, it brought you power, it brought you energy, it brought you sustenance, food. You wanted to build your town on the Amazon. Where do you want to build your town today? On Amazon.com. You want to build it on the digital flows. And we can now watch these digital flows. We see ideas change and congeal and reform globally now faster than ever before. And today, the center of our economy is being in touch with these digital flows, whether you're in manufacturing or in services. Those four changes in power, the power of one, the power of machines, the power of flows, and the power of many, they're not just changing your world, friends. They're reshaping your world. They're reshaping your world. And they're reshaping five realms, politics, geopolitics, ethics, the community, and the workplace. So let's talk for a little bit about how they're reshaping the world. Do I have any water up here? Uh, I guess I don't. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> let's start with what's central to all of your lives, the workplace. How is it being reshaped? Well, let me start by sharing with you one more graphic. Um, when I was working on the book, I went out to um, uh, Google X, Google's research arm, and interviewed Astro Teller, who's the a CEO there. His title is Chief Astronaut. And I um, laid out my thesis to Astro of my book and my accelerations. And um, he um, went over and got three magic markers, went over to his whiteboard, and he drew up a simple graph. So I said, what's that, Astro? First, he drew that blue line across the middle. I said, what's that, Astro? He said, that's the average rate at which human beings, societies, and Lancaster County adapts to change over time. So you'll notice it has a positive slope, but it's very gradual. <laughs> um, he, would you believe he did mention Lancaster County? <laughs> yeah, did. Um, uh, the white line is technology. And you'll notice it's very flat over here. That's because in the 12th century, 11th century, technological change was very slow. Your bow and arrow didn't get better over a whole century. You, there was no bow and arrow 2.0 in the 12th century, okay? <laughs> Line was very flat, but then we got the scientific revolution, Copernicus and Galileo, and then we got Intel and, 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 uh, and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and suddenly the line starts to go due north. Then he drew that little white diamond up there. I said, what's that, Astro? He said, that's where we are. We're at a place now where technology is moving and changing faster than the average human being and society can adapt to. 
Then he went and got another magic marker, and he drew a little dotted line there, up from the adaptation line. I said, what's that, Astro? He said, that's learning faster and governing smarter. And that is the task of Lancaster County's community leadership. How can we enable more citizens to learn faster, and how can we govern smarter to lift the slope of our adaptation line so it meets technology where it is and where it's going? And that's why my chapter on the workplace is actually called How We Turn AI into IA. How do we take artificial intelligence and turn it into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms, so more people in Lancaster County, uh, I got things, um, can learn faster and govern smarter. I'll give you an example of each one of these, intelligent assistance, intelligent assistant, intelligent algorithms, so you understand what, I'm, what I mean. So uh, my, my example of intelligent assistance is built on the Human Resources Department at AT&T, by the giant global telecom. 330,000 employees, lives right next to the supernova, super competitive global telecom space. Pretty good chance that whatever is going on at AT&T in Human Resources is coming to a Lancaster County near you. So what's going on in HR at AT&T? Well, basically, they begin their year now with their CEO, Randall Stevenson, gives a pretty radically transparent speech about where the company's going, what business they're going to be in, and what skills you need that year to be a rising employee at AT&T. Then they put all their uh, managers, 110,000 people, on their own internal LinkedIn system. So they've got Tom Friedman there, and they see my uh, education uh, degrees and whatnot. They see the jobs I've done you know, at AT&T and any course I've taken. Then they plotted the, I'm making up the number because it changes all the time, but the 10 skill sets you need to be a rising employee at AT&T that year. And then they matched them up with my profile. It turns out I have seven of the 10, but I'm missing three. Then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun from Udacity, the online learning university, and he created nano degrees, nano online degrees for all 10 skill sets. Then they came back to me and said, Tom, here's the deal. We will give you up to $8,000 a year to take the courses for the skill sets you're missing. In fact, we heard that um, you're interested in archaeology. We'll pay for that as well. Um, we also heard you're interested in computing. We just created a $6,000 a year online master's degree in computer science from Georgia Tech. We're in for that as well. Just one condition, Mr. Tom. You have to take these courses at home, at night, on weekends, on your own time, not on company time. Now, if I come back to at and and say, you know, Mr. at and I've climbed up one too many telephone poles. I'm just not into this anymore. They now have a wonderful severance package for me. <laughs> but chances are I probably won't be working there much longer. They flush out about 30,000 people a year. They um, uh, hire about 30,000, and they advance about 10,000. What is the new social contract between AT&T and its employees? It's very simple. You can still be a lifelong employee at AT&T, but now only if you're a lifelong learner. If you are not ready to be a lifelong learner, you can no longer be a lifelong employee at AT&T. And that is the social contract coming to a Lancaster County near you. The days when you could get a four-year or two-year degree, or high school degree, and expect to dine out on that for 30 years, that is so 1950s. Stuff you learn now in your first year of college may be outdated by the fourth year, if it's in certain technical fields. You can only be a lifelong employee now if you're ready to be a lifelong learner. And that's why one of my teachers, Heather McGowan, the education experts, likes to tell parents, Mom, Dad, Never ask your kid anymore what you want to be when you grow up. Because whatever it is, it won't be there unless it's policemen or firemen. Okay? Only ask your kid today how you want to be when you grow up. 
Will you have an agile learning mindset? Will you be predisposed to be a lifelong learner? And that's leading to something that really is agitating our society, and I think all Western societies. Something I learned from another teacher of mine, Marina Gorbis, from the Institute of the Future. Marina likes to say, you know, if I were giving this lecture here 15 years ago, you can bet we'd be talking about the digital divide. Hey, Philadelphia's got internet, Lancaster County doesn't. Or Lancaster's got it and outlying counties don't. America's got it and Africa does. There was a big digital divide and it really mattered because people couldn't get connected. Well, today the digital divide is rapidly disappearing. I would say in five, certainly 10, it'll be completely gone. And when that's gone, says Marina, the biggest divide in the world will no longer be the digital divide. It will be the self-motivation divide. Whose kids have the self-motivation to be lifelong learners long after they've left home and mom and dad are not there to say, Tommy, have you done your homework? And this has a lot of people, frankly, understandably roiled. Because our country was built by people who like to be told what to do. And a lot of people like to be told what to do. And God bless them, we owe them a huge debt. They built our country. We asked them, we told them what to do, and they built our country. But unfortunately, just doing what you're told will not produce average income and average lifestyle anymore. Because average is officially over. And that has a lot of people understandably roiled. My example of intelligent assistant, ANT, is the janitorial staff at Qualcomm. Qualcomm is another company I spent a lot of time. I profiled their, law, their, their founder, Erwin Jacobs. So um, Qualcomm, another company you may not have heard that much about, they actually made the inside of your iPhone. They made the chips and the software. That's why Apple is always suing Qualcomm over patents. <laughs> so um, uh, they have a 64 building campus in San Diego. And three and a half years ago now, they took six of their buildings and they put sensors everywhere on every light, every drain, every faucet, every window, every door, every heating, cooling system, computer, you name it, they put a sensor on it. And then they beamed all that data from those sensors up to the cloud and then they beamed it back down onto an iPad with an incredibly friendly user interface for their janitors. Qualcomm turned their janitors into maintenance technologists. Their janitors now give tours to foreign visitors. What do you think that does for the dignity of a janitor? Because he or she now has an intelligent assistant enabling them to learn faster and operate smarter. My examples of intelligent algorithms, the first is um, uh, the partnership between Khan Academy, the online learning platform, and the college board, the people who administer the PSAT and SAT college entrance exams. We all know the story. In 11th grade, we have to take the PSAT exam, the practice SAT, to determine our math and verbal skills and get us ready for the SAT exam to see if we can get into the college of our choice. We also know that parents who can afford it, perfectly legal, go out and hire a tutor from Kaplan or one of these outfits, local outfits, to goose their kids' scores in math and verbal to get higher scores on the PSAT and SAT test. Perfectly legal, but a completely rigged game. Because if you come from a family or neighborhood that can't afford a $200 an hour PSAT or SAT tutor, you're at a real disadvantage. So three years ago, the College Board partnered with Khan Academy and they created an intelligent algorithm for free PSAT and SAT prep. The way it works is I take my PSAT exam in 11th grade, I get the results back. The results say, uh, Tom, 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 you did really well in verbal. You could be a journalist. Um, but uh, um, you have a problem in math. Uh, actually, specifically, you have a problem with fractions and right angles. It then takes me directly to a practice site just for my weakness, fractions and right angles. If I do well there, it takes me to another site that says, you could be in AP math. Moi? In AP math? No one in my neighborhood has been in AP math. No one in my family has been in AP math. I could be in AP math. Yeah, you could be in AP math. I do well there. It takes me to another site with 180 college scholarships. Last year, 3 million American kids got free PSAT and SAT prep on this intelligent algorithm. 
Another example of intelligent algorithms, opportunity at work. We have about 32 million Americans who start college but don't finish. So some go one year, two, two and a half, three, three and a half years, and they drop out. They go into the workplace, workforce, apply uh, for a job with one of you. You say, where's your BA? No BA, sorry, no job. A huge waste of human talent. So recently, a whole set of intelligent algorithms, I profile opportunity at work, have come to the fore, where they, you can now come to them, they will actually badge your knowledge, what you learned in one, two, two and a half, three years, and they will partner with companies who are ready to hire you on the basis of what you can actually do with your knowledge, not on some pedigree degree. So I tell the story of Lashana Lewis, a young African-American woman who went to Michigan Tech. She studied computer science for three and a half years, had to drop out for family reasons, ended up driving a school bus to and from a computer school, couldn't make that up, and working on the help desk at a law firm, helping lawyers rediscover their lost passwords. <laughs> she was discovered by opportunity at work. They connected her with MasterCard. MasterCard took a chance and hired her as a systems engineer. Today, she's a senior systems engineer. And as Lashana says in the last line of her interview in my book, and Mr. Friedman, I still don't have my BA. That is an intelligent algorithm. Now, I'm going to make you all a bet. I'm going to bet that none of you have heard of any of this. And that's because you've actually been following our politics, which has not been about these intelligent algorithms. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there, OK? <laughs> but that's a good segue to how is politics being reshaped as a result of these accelerations? Now, basically, there, if you look around the world today, all our political parties are blowing up. They're all blowing up left, right, and center because, in fact, they were designed for a different era. They were designed to answer questions of the Industrial Revolution. And the central question there was capitalism versus labor, big government versus small government. I would argue that in my age of acceleration, politics has to be about a whole different set of axes. And the way I describe it is that I think to understand what politics needs to be about today to serve a community like Lancaster is to understand that it, we, are, we are in the middle of three climate changes at once. That's another way of describing my accelerations. We're in the middle of the change of the climate of the climate. Uh, we're going from what I call later to now. So when I was growing up in Minnesota in the 50s, later was when I could clean that river, fix that lake, save that forest, rescue that orangutan. I could do it now or I could do it later. Well, today, later is officially over. Later will now be too late. So whatever you're going to save, please save it now. We, you, your kids, we are the Noah generation. We are going to have to save the last two. That's a climate change. We're in the middle of a change of the climate of globalization. We're going from an interconnected world to an interdependent world. And in an interdependent world, you get a real geoeconomic inversion. First of all, your friends start to be able to kill you faster than your enemies. If Greek and Italian banks go under tonight, this room is half full. Wait a minute, Greece and Italy, they're so far away. And anyways, they're allies, they're in the EU, they're in NATO. Yeah, in an interdependent world, Greek and Italian banks can kill Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And in an interdependent world, your rivals falling becomes more dangerous than your rivals rising. If China tonight takes six more islands in the South China Sea, personally, couldn't care less. If China tonight loses 6% growth, this room is empty. China falling in an interdependent world, much more dangerous than China rising. That's a climate change. And lastly, we're going through a climate change in business. Every one of you in business knows every business today can and therefore must analyze, optimize, prophesize, customize 
socialize and digitize in ways unimaginable just a decade ago. You can now analyze your data and find the needle in the haystack of your data as the norm, not the exception. You can optimize, I flew home the other day in United Airlines, GE engines connected to GE by sensors. GE could tell United exactly what altitude to fly to get the maximum energy efficiency out of those engines to optimize. You can prophesize. You may have seen the IBM Watson ad where the repairman shows up at a high-rise building and tells the doorman, I'm here to fix the elevator. The doorman says, the elevator is not broken. And the IBM Watson repairman says, I know, but it will be in six weeks and three days. You can do predictive analytics on anything. You can prophesize. You can socialize using social networks. You can connect with your customers, your suppliers, um, your, your workers in ways you never could before. You can customize just for guys from Minnesota with a mustache and brown eyes. And you cannot digitize slash automatize increasing numbers of jobs, products, and services. You put all those together, you have a real climate change in business. So I thought about that. I thought, well, what do you want when the climate changes? You want two things. You want resilience. You need to take a blow because stuff happens when the climate changes. And though you want propulsion as well. You don't want to be curled up in a ball under your bed waiting for the climate change to pass. So then I sat back and said, well, if you want resilience and propulsion when the climate changes, and we're in the middle of three climate changes at once, who do I call to learn how you build resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? And then I remembered, I knew this woman. She was 3.8 billion years old. Her name was Mother Nature, and she dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So I called her up, made an appointment, went out to see her. I sat down, I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? She said, well, Tom, I have to tell you everything I do, I do unconsciously, but um, these are my strategies. Uh, first, she said, I'm incredibly adaptive. In my world, it's not the strongest who survive. It's not the smartest who survive. It's the most adaptive who survive in climate change. And I teach people that through a rather brutal mechanism I call natural selection. Second, she said, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Okay, wherever I see a blank space in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Third, she said, I'm incredibly pluralistic. Oh, Tom, I'm the most pluralistic person you've ever met. I love diversity. I try 20 different species of everything, see who wins. And she told me something interesting. She told me she found that her most diverse ecosystems were her most resilient ecosystems. And her most monoculture ecosystems were the most easily subject to disease. Oh, she said, I love diversity. Fourth, she said, I'm really into feedback loops. I'm very attentive to the feedback I get and quickly use it to adapt. Fifth, she said, I'm incredibly sustainable. Everything is food in a circular way. Eat food, poop seed, eat food, poop seed. Nothing wasted in my world, she said. Sixth, she said, I'm incredibly hybrid and heterodox. So I'll try any kind of trees with any kind of soils, any kind of bees with any kind of flowers. And lastly, though, she did tell me, she said, Tom, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures. I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. Well, my argument is that the country, the company, the community, the Lancaster County, that most closely mirrors Mother Nature's strategies for building resilience and propulsion when the climate changes, is the one that will thrive in the age of acceleration. And since I was writing the book in 2016, an election year, I imagined, what if Mother Nature were running against Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election? And so I invented, on the basis of Mother Nature's strategies, Mother Nature's political party. Which, of course, is just a proxy for my own politics, but never mind. Okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I won't go into detail, they're in the book, it's an 18-point platform, but on some issues, um, Mother Nature, she's out there on the left with Bernie. Yo, she is, yeah, because Mother Nature would believe in universal health care, okay, and lifelong learning systems, because she would understand this world's going to be too damn fast for more and more people. We need to strengthen our safety nets. 
But at the same time, Mother Nature would be out there on the right with the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Because she'd also believe that to pay for these safety nets, we have to get radically entrepreneurial. In fact, Mother Nature, Mother Nature would abolish all corporate taxes. She would, though, replace them with a carbon tax, a tax on sugar, a tax on bullets, and a small financial transaction tax. She would get radically entrepreneurial here in order to strengthen these safety nets over here. Of course, what do we know about our current right-left politics? If you're for stronger safety nets, you're never for radical entrepreneurship. If you're for radical entrepreneurship, you're never for stronger safety nets. What would Mother Nature call that? Stupid, she'd call it. Because <laughs> she will tell you, you will never build resilience and propulsion unless you're doing both of these things at once. And that's why all these parties are blowing up because their choices they're built on can't contain the actual choices we need to make going forward to build resilience and propulsion in our countries and communities. Let me close by talking about two areas, one really relevant to you, I think they're both relevant to you, but that people haven't thought that much about that are being reshaped, and you heard me allude to them in the beginning. The first is ethics. Ethics. We think, what, what does ethics have to do with this story? It has a lot to do with this story. So my chapter on how the world of ethics is being reshaped is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Is God in Cyberspace? Best question I ever got on book tour. 1999, I'm selling a book called Lexus and the Olive Tree. I'm at the Portland Theater in Portland, Oregon. Young man stands up in the balcony at question time, says, Mr. Friedman, I have a question. Is God in cyberspace? I said, ah, 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 next question, please. I felt like an idiot. I didn't have an answer. So I got home. I called my spiritual teacher. He's a rabbi. I got to know when I was the New York Times correspondent in Jerusalem. His name is Sophie Marks, brilliant Talmudic scholar. Now lives in Amsterdam, married to a Dutch priest. Interesting character. I tracked him down in Amsterdam. I said, Svi, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have answered? And he said, well, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. The one is a biblical concept, the other is a post-biblical concept. The biblical concept says the Almighty is uh, Almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full, we know, of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, people smearing one another in Twitter, and now we know fake news. <laughs> but fortunately, he said, we have a post-biblical view of God. And the post-biblical view of God says God manifests himself by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. Only we can bring God into cyberspace. I really liked his answer. I put it into the paperback edition um, uh, of the book, which came out in the year 2000, where none of you saw it. And it sat there for 17 years. Um, I started writing this new book, and I found myself spontaneously retelling that story. And finally, I sat myself down and said, why are you retelling that story? And it became obvious to me for two reasons. One, I think, just happened. I think in the last couple of years, we began living 51% of our lives, we in the developed world, began living 51% of our lives in cyberspace. Yeah, that's where you go now to find a date, find a spouse, find a house, buy a car, buy your shoes, um, do your mortgage, do your banking, do your learning, get your news, generate your news. You're now living. More than half your life, and your kids certainly are, now in cyberspace. And what's my definition of cyberspace? It's a realm where we're all connected and no one's in charge. Oh, yeah, there's no police in cyberspace, you may have noticed. There's no stop signs, no stoplights, no courts, no justice, no 1-800. Please stop Putin from hacking my election. And yet that's where you're now living more than half your life. And at the same time, 
Because of these three accelerating forces I described, the way they are super empowering men, women, and machines, we're now standing at a moral intersection we've never stood at before as a human species. See, in 1945, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us. If it had to be one country, I'm glad it was mine. I think we're now entering a world because of these super empowered men, women, machines, where one person can kill all of us. And at the same time, where all of us could actually fix everything. We've actually never been at this intersection before where one of us could kill all of us. And all of us now, if we put our mind to it, we actually have the tools to feed, house, clothe, and educate every person on the planet. We have never been here before as a species. And what is this place? What does this mean? It means we've never been more godlike as a species than we are today. So put those two together. You've never lived more of your life in a realm that's God-free, and we have never been more God-like. What does that mean? It means values matter today more than ever. It means everyone needs to be in the grip of sustainable values, because today, in that kind of world, what every person thinks, feels, and believes now really matters. Everyone needs to be in the grip of values, and at a minimum, the golden rule. Every faith and culture has their version of it. Do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. Because we now live in a world where more people can do unto you farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. Putin did unto us in our last election. And we can do unto others farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. Everyone today needs to be in the embrace at a minimum of the golden rule. I know what you're thinking. I actually gave this part of my talk as the commencement address a couple years ago at Olin College of Engineering. And I told the parents there at this point, I know what you're thinking. You paid 200 grand for your kid to get an engineering degree. And who do they bring in as the commencement speaker <laughs> but a knucklehead promoting the golden rule? Is there anything more naive? And what I told them is what I will tell you. In this age of acceleration, naivete is the new realism. Because I'll tell you what's really naive. What's really naive is thinking we're going to be okay when men, women, and machines get this super empowered and we become this interdependent if everyone is not in the embrace of the golden rule. Where does the golden rule come from? I think it comes primarily from two places. Uh, strong families, excuse me, strong families and healthy communities. I'm not an expert on strong families. I hope I built one, but I'd never presume to lecture you on my family. But I am an expert on healthy communities because I grew up in one. A little town outside of Minneapolis called St. Louis Park. And that's why my book, after all this talk of accelerations and technology and Moore's Law and globalization, it ends with me going back home to my little town where I learned the most valuable lesson of all, the golden rule. So the story is simple. My grandparents were born in Eastern Europe. They emigrated to Minnesota in the 20s or early, early part of the 20th century. My parents were both born in Minneapolis. Um, in the early 20s. And um, Minneapolis then, uh, unfortunately, was the capital of anti-Semitism in America uh, in the 30s and 40s um, until Hubert Humphrey became mayor, but my family couldn't join the automobile club, things like that. It was an ugly scene. Lots of um, uh, religious and, and racial segregation. Um, and because of that, uh, the Jewish community in Minneapolis almost entirely lived in the north side of the city in a ghetto with African Americans, not because we were integrated there, but because we were both isolated there. Anyways, after the war, the Jews were able to escape. And between 1953, when I was born, and 1956, virtually the entire Jewish community of Minneapolis moved out to one suburb, one town, just on the outskirts of the city called St. Louis Park. Overnight, my aunt and uncle moved one door this way, my other aunt and uncle moved one door that way, my other uncle. Overnight, a, 
community, a little town that had been 100% white Protestant Catholic Scandinavian, became 20% Jewish, 80% white Protestant Catholic Scandinavian. If Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, okay? <laughs> um, and thus began a rather interesting experiment in inclusion. It's as if God said, I'm going to throw these really, you know, pluralistic Swedes together with these neurotic Jews shot out of the ghetto. We called ourselves, we the Jews of Minnesota, the frozen chosen. Okay. And um, <laughs> we were thrown together in this little town. And, um, and I tell the story in the penultimate chapter of the book of how we all got to know each other. And there were broken dates and broken hearts and broken friendships. But over time, um, we really built a, and your community feels a lot like it, an amazing little community. Um, because I tell in the book, I actually went to the same high school, religious school, grew up in the same neighborhood, roughly the same time with the Cone brothers, the filmmakers. Uh, Al Franken, the senator, Norm Ornstein, the political scientist, Michael Sandel, the political theorist, Mark Tressman, the former coach of the Chicago Bears, he was our high school quarterback, Sharon Isbin, the guitarist, Alan Wiseman won the National Book Award. We have our own Wikipedia page. It was a freaky place, okay? Um, and it imbued in all of us a deep civic ethic, which we all took into the world in different ways. The Coen brothers into film, uh, Franken and Ornstein into politics, Sandel into political theory, Peggy Ornstein into literature. I took it into, into journalism. The Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man, was about our little town. And if you saw No Country for Old Men, you remember a scene where Churga blows up a car outside of a pharmacy in Mexico to go in and steal drugs. And at the end of the scene, the camera pans to the pharmacy and it's called Mike Zoss Drugs. That was our little St. Louis Park drugstore. <laughs> So it was an interesting little community, but as I said, it imbued in us a deep civic ethic that we all took out into the world. You have to have been, grown up in Minnesota to appreciate it. We call it Minnesota nice. Minnesota nice. Hard to explain Minnesota nice. I give a couple of examples in the book. I was actually home working on the book. I um, uh, went to my best friend Ken Greer's wedding, and our friend uh, Jay Goldberg came and sat down at the table next to me. He said, Tom, my wife Eileen was driving on the ring road around Minneapolis today, and a driver almost drove her off the road. And she came home and said, Jay, I was so mad I almost honked. <laughs> so, that's Minnesota for road rage. Um, <laughs> There was, a, uh, there was a Jewish mafia in Minnesota in the 30s and 40s, led by a gangster named Kid Can. And uh, my dad grew up with these guys. I swear he was not in the mafia. But when I was uh, five or six years old, I came home one day, and my dad told me that uh, a friend of his had been sent to jail. And when you're a five- or six-year-old kid, and your dad comes home and says he knows someone who went to prison, that just freaked me out. Which is why I never forgot when I said to my dad, Dad, dad what did he do? And my dad said, um, uh, Tommy, he was, uh, he was shopping in a store before it was open. Um, that's Minnesota for breaking and entering, okay? So now you know why I'm the congenital optimist, you know, in my column. Anyways, I left Minnesota in 1971 to discover the world. And I came back 40 years later for the last chapter of this book and discovered that the world had found St. Louis Park. Now my high school, this is going to sound very familiar to you. My high school is now 50% white Protestant Catholic Scandinavian, it's 10% Jewish, it's 10% Latino, and now 30% Somali. Some African American, mostly Somali, because the little town that took the Jews 50 years ago took the Somali refugees this time around. Sound familiar? And now the challenge of absorption, community building, inclusion, much deeper, racially and religiously. And I go home and tell the story about how they're doing. And the reason I do it is because ain't that the challenge of America today? Ain't that the challenge of Lancaster County? Ain't that the challenge of the world? How they doing? They're doing pretty well. It's a struggle. It's hard. I don't have to tell you. There are ups, there are downs. But my high school is still one of the highest rated high schools in the state of Minnesota with a very very different demographic. But it's hard work. But the reason my book is called An Optimist Guide to Thriving, people often ask me where from comes the optimism. 
is not because I think everyone's getting it right and everyone's gotten it right, not my town, not, not your town. It's that I'm struck as I travel around this country and speak to communities like yours, how many people, like the guy who introduced me tonight, want to get caught trying. That's why I'm an optimist. You want to be an optimist about America today? Stand on your head. The country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down, okay? Um, because of the number of people. So one of my teachers for the book, uh, who taught me all the physics in the book, Amory Lovins, the great physicist, uh, said to me, People often ask Amory, Amory, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And Amory says, look, I'm neither, because they're two different, just two different forms of fatalism. Everything will be great. Everything will be awful. Amory said, I believe in applied hope. I believe in applied hope. Not sure it's going to work out okay, but I believe in applied hope. And that's what I've seen in your community in just a few hours I've been here. Not sure it's going to work, but I am impressed at the number of people here trying to apply hope. And so that's why my talk tonight and my book uh, end with a, a theme song. My book has a theme song. I actually thought, can I buy this song? So when you open the book, you would play this song. Like a Hallmark card plays Happy Birthday. <laughs> because I believe this song is the anthem of our time. It's by one of my favorite singers. Her name is Brandi Carla. She's a great country folk singer. And her song is called The Eye. E Y E. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. You see my three accelerations? They're a hurricane. We have leaders all over the world trying to build a wall against these winds of change, against the hurricane. I'm actually trying to build an eye the healthy community, an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability, like riding a bike, where people can feel connected, protected, and respected. I think the great struggle in politics all over the world in the coming years is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.